Um, all right. Well, uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone from the West Coast. This is Dan McAvoy from the Western Regional Climate Center. Thanks for joining our April edition of uh, West Watch. Um, I don't know if someone in the audience can just type into the chat that they're seeing and hearing everything good. That would be appreciated. And maybe Joe, you can just check on that. Um, but we have our, our April edition today, and I'm going to go ahead and get started as we're at 201. Um, I think many have seen the West Watch, but uh, there may be new people on the line. So we're just going to go quickly over what is the West Watch. This is uh, now a monthly webinar series, um, mostly intended to bring together NOAA staff and partners um, to share information about climate observations and impacts across the West. Uh, th there is now two formats of the West Watch. The one we're doing today are the, uh, the, um, the West Watch that started several years ago, where the, these are the general uh, climate overviews uh, for the terrestrial climate, and then also um, the coastal and ocean, ocean conditions from our IUS partners. And then um, we have another format, which is every other month, where we have a more um, topic-specific uh, webinar. Last uh, last month, there was an ENSO-specific topic, um, and so these will change each month with uh, experts from, from those areas. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I think we have one quick poll question for the audience that should pop up here in a second. I think Joe's going to prompt that. To, to go. Okay, you should be seeing the poll now. And we'll give folks a second on that. And the question is, have you attended West Watch previously? Just to get a sense of um, new or existing uh, people on the webinar today. Okay, so thank you for submitting that. Um, it looks like 43%, this is the first time on the West Watch. And so welcome to everyone um, who is new today and also to those have been, that have been on before. Exciting to have new people. Um, so quickly about the, the format, um, we'll have about 10 to 15 minute presentations from each speaker. Um, if you do have questions, there is a question box that you can enter those questions into, and we will try to have time to get to those questions and have, um, after each speaker, have a, a minute or two for, for questions that come up. Um, just so everyone knows, these are this is being recorded, and it, 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 there is a Westwatch uh, website where you'll be able to find these uh, recorded presentations, and then there will also be a post-webinar uh, survey and the feedback is always appreciated on these. Okay, so today's uh, lineup, I'll be starting off with the regional uh, climate brief and uh, outlook, and then we'll move into our IUS partners. We're, we'll start off with uh, Roxanne Carini from Nanus, and then move down the coast to Henry Roll from Sencus, and all the way down south to Clarissa Anderson from uh, Scus. And so we got a lot of content, so I'm gonna jump right in and get into our climate uh, update and outlook. And I just wanted to start off with some of the recent temperature and precipitation departures. So on the left, we have our um, percent of average precipitation over the past 30 days. And then on the right is the uh, difference from average temperature over the last 30 days. So if we start with um, precipitation, we, we see there was still quite a, uh, quite a few areas that saw above normal precipitation over the last month or so, uh, particularly in the upper Colorado River Basin, Utah. Um, and I think one area to note is Oregon that has picked up, um, improved on some of the deficits that they have accumulated over the water year. And so it's been good for Oregon. And even down into California, um, kind of near average some places, a little below in other spots, but some places like the Sierra and places along the coast actually could use a break from this extremely wet winter. But um, what I really want to point out is on the right that we're, you know, nearly the entire West again was below average over the last 30 days. This has been a persistent pattern over the entire water year. And so now we're uh, sh shifting gears, same maps, but now the time period is the water year uh, precipitation and temperature um, to date. And this, this was through April 14th. 
And if we pick up again on with the temperatures on the right, uh, this has been a very cold water year and winter for nearly the you know entire Western United States. For some places, this is the coldest water year to date um, in at least several decades, if not longer than that. And so that's uh, good for a lot of reasons when it comes to drought and water supply and snowpack, which we'll get into. Um, but the water year precipitation, um, well above average across California, Great Basin, Upper Colorado River Basin, into the Northern Rockies. Really, the Pacific Northwest is um, one of the few areas that is uh, slightly below average precipitation for the water year. And then um, um, Southeast Colorado and, and Northeast New Mexico also have some pretty big uh, deficits that have accumulated over the water year. But I think the big um, story really this winter and this water year has been the huge snowpacks that have accumulated across a lot of the western U.S. and what that's going to mean moving forward into the spring and summer. Um, I was, uh, these are some pictures from myself from a few weeks ago at the end of March in North Lake Tahoe where um, it's near record uh, snowpack for that time of year. Um, Tahoe is a snowy place but um, this is a lot of snow for that time of year. This is near lake level and um, just uh, really incredible to see how much snow is still there right now and it's just starting to melt in some places. Um, so here's a snapshot of the, the most recent snowpack from the NRCS uh, Snowtel network. Um, this is from April 16th, so just a couple days ago. And these show the basin, the numbers are showing the basin, uh, river basin average values from the Snowtel, all the Snowtel stations. All that dark blue is greater than 150% of normal for the date, and it's really great to see those numbers widespread across the West. Um, places with the lowest snowpack right now, again, are in the Pacific Northwest, but it's still not extremely low at all. There are some areas slightly below average um, to near average, but there's really no uh, extreme snow drought at all right now. Um, and for a lot of places, the peak SWE, uh, peak snow water equivalent, peak snowpack, um, has already occurred or, or is occurring right now. So we're reaching that peak and starting to transition into the snow melt and runoff season. Um, but some of the, the numbers across the West are really impressive. Uh, there's records showing up, um, record high snowpack in the Snowtel record, which goes back uh, 40 plus years for a lot of places. On the upper left is for the Car Carson River Basin, which drains out of the uh, Northern uh, Sierra Nevada uh, into Northwest Nevada. Um, and the basin is still at record high uh, snow water equivalent. The black trace is for this year, and then the green trace in there is, is the normal trace, and then I've also highlighted 2022 to show how much more snow there is this year compared to last year at the same time. So again, record uh, for this basin, um, and you can see the, uh, the snow melt starting to occur about a week ago in this basin, um, and then on the bottom right, is one of the uh, basins in the upper Colorado, the Dolores Basin, also at record for this time of year in the, in the Snowtel record, which is great to see. Uh, our last webinar was uh, two months ago, and we were wondering if we would see some increases or decreases, and, and the uh, storm train continued to push through uh, and bringing a lot more um, liquid and snowpack to the mountains. And so this is really great to see uh, these records. Um, and some some of the numbers are kind of mind-boggling to see just how much snow there is in some of these places. This is from Mammoth Pass uh, near Mammoth Mountain, uh, California in the eastern Sierra Nevada. Um, and this is from the snow survey, which has records, manual snow survey, which has records at this location back to 1931. So this is showing the ranked distribution uh, of the April 1 snow survey. Um, and so all the way on the right, um, is the, the highest ranks, and then all the way on the left is the lowest. And we see this year, 2023, there was 104.5 inches, um, which just blows away the previous record of 1969, which was um, almost 20 inches of liquid less. And this isn't 20 inches of snowfall less, this is 20 inches of snow water equivalent less. And so it's just really amazing to see that. And then all the way on the far Left end, we had 2015, where there was just 1.5 inches at the same time of year. So just some perspective on just how much snow is in the eastern Sierra Nevada right now. And of course, this has brought widespread improvements um, in drought conditions 
across uh, you know the entire western US. So on the left is the US drought monitor from the beginning of the water year and on the right is the most recent from from April 11th and so a lot of drought eliminated um, and a lot of it being reduced and will probably further be eliminated as we move into spring and summer. Um, and so thinking ahead now um, as to what's going to happen to all that uh, snow that is in the mountains right now, I'm showing the NRCS um, April through July percent of median. These are the stream flow forecasts, the percent of median volumes for the April through July period. Um, and again, the blues here are for the basins showing greater than 200 percent of normal uh, runoff and then the uh, tans are below normal. And so what we're seeing is across the, the Eastern Sierra, Great Basin, uh, Utah basins, we're seeing you know two to three times the normal amount of April through July runoff um, that is possible. This is a forecast now, um, but we do see some, some below normal uh, forecasts for parts of the Pacific Northwest. And this is due to a combination of um, snow that's not as, you know, not as deep as what we've been seeing across other parts of the West, but also antecedent conditions, soil moisture, antecedent drought conditions underlying the snowpack that could reduce the stream flows moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, we're starting to see snow melt. Um, we saw these are just a couple of snapshots of hydrographs, one from near Lake Tahoe, another one from near Aspen, Colorado, showing a very similar pattern where we're starting to see the diurnal signal in the stream flow indicating that we're really starting to see uh, melt in, in uh, some of the mid to higher elevations now for the first time this year. Um, and the other thing to be aware of now is that with all that snow, we're almost certainly likely to see um, flooding. And so Tulare Lake in the southern um, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley of California, has been making headlines. Um, this is a lake that was drained years ago for um, agricultural purposes is now uh, filling back up again uh, due to the, the snowmelt uh, runoff. And so this has happened in the past where it has filled up, I believe, 1997 and 1983. Um, but this is an image from Planet Labs uh, showing the extent of what's happened so far. I think this is probably within the last month. If you look at the scale on the bottom left, that's uh, five miles. And so that is actually, you know, the size of a lake, five to 10 miles in width in some places. And so this is gonna have a huge impact on, on agriculture um, in this part of the Central Valley. Um, and it's not just California. These are a few headlines from Colorado, Utah, and um, Northwest Nevada also raising concerns about snowmelt flooding um, as we move into the, uh, later into the spring. Um, and so as we move further into the southwest, a place that we're not likely to see flooding or we need as much water as possible is Lake Powell and Lake Mead, the two uh, biggest reservoirs in the country that provide a lot of water to the southwest. And so there is, you know, good news from this winter. I think the, um, the, 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 the story that, you know, the message that we've been trying to get out there is that this winter is going to be very beneficial, of course, for the region, but this one single uh, really wet winter is, is not going to refill Lake, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Um, as you can see, they're currently at about 23 and 29% of capacity. Uh, the total system contents is, is at 32% of capacity, which is a little less than it was at the same time last year. Then on the bottom are some forecasted numbers, and I highlighted the forecasted April through July. Um, this is uh, inflow into Lake Powell, and right now that forecast is for 177% of normal, which is great to see. And I looked at my um, image from two months ago when I presented that, and that April through July forecast was 117% of average. So these are the, the inflow forecasts are continuing to go up um, as uh, there's been a lot more precipitation and snowpack in the mountains. So this is all um, good news, but what might it really mean for the, the elevations and lake levels in Powell and Mead? These are the 24-month projections from the Bureau of Reclamation. This one is for um, Lake Powell. And so these are from January and March showing a range of uh, probable uh, lake levels based on inflows into Lake Powell. What we see is that Powell is likely to see good rises um, by the end of the summer, uh, which is good news above where it was last summer. And so that, of course, is, is really good news. Um, 
but you know um, there's a lot of question about Lake Mead and I saw this graph for the first time and saw that you know by the summer end of the summer um, Lake Mead might still continue to decline and what I've heard is that that's all dependent on the releases from Lake Powell even though Powell's going to rise there might not be enough releases to have rises in Lake Mead by the end of the summer. And so, um, again, this really emphasizes this isn't just about the drought, it's a heavily managed system. Um, but the bottom line is that the snowpack and um, the big water year is gonna be helpful in the long run to the um, combined system storage. Um, so I wanna quickly go through the ENSO update. This was based on the Sea Climate Prediction Center. Um, report from uh, Monday morning on April 17th and so we are now currently um, in an El Nino watch and so this means there's a, um, that El Nino conditions are likely to develop over the next few months uh, currently still officially and so new, neutral conditions are present um, you can see on the map on the right that the sea surface temperatures are near to above average across most, most of the Pacific, but heating up quickly, especially in the Eastern um, Pacific. And so, uh, and so neutral conditions are expected to continue through uh, the spring, followed by a 62% of El Nino developing uh, during the May through July period. And so these are the outlooks from, uh, the official outlooks from the CPC um, IRI group. And so uh, there's two ways to look at these. The, the top left is showing the probabilities of either La Nina uh, neutral or El Nino conditions going out uh, each season, moving through the course of the next nine months or so. And then the bottom right is showing the plume of all those uh, projections that go into making the probabilities. And so um, we see that we have transitioned from La Nina into neutral. And so if you look at the first season there on the top left, it's almost 100% chance. This is That's March, April, May of being in so neutral. And then it quickly changes to higher probabilities of El Nino developing starting around May, June, July. And then by the time you get to the summer, the first summer uh, season, June, July, August, that increases to over a 70% chance of being in an El Nino, and that goes up to above 80 as we get uh, to later in the summer. And then the, on the bottom right, you can kind of see the magnitude and the range of outcomes from the different models. I will say this, this graph on the bottom right is from uh, mid-March. There is likely one from mid-April that will come out soon. Um, I've seen some April projections from the NMME, the North American Multimodel Ensemble, that do show the magnitude a little stronger towards El Nino um, than what we saw in this March outlook. So um, the return to El Nino conditions are looking more likely by summer. There is still uncertainty in that, uh, but there's definitely growing confidence um, in transitioning to El Nino. And uh, lastly, here's the, the outlook from the Climate Prediction Center for the next season, the May through July. Uh, this was actually issued March 16th. The next one is going to be coming out in just a couple of days, so this will probably change a little bit. And this is a little um, little older, but this is uh, on the left are the probabilities for temperatures, and on the right are probabilities for precipitation. And what we see is uh, the odds are leaning towards above normal May through July temperatures across uh, much of the West. Um, the higher, highest probabilities are um, in Arizona and New Mexico, where you get into over a 50% chance of above normal temperatures. Um, as you get into the Pacific Northwest and far northern Rockies, there's equal chances of above or below, temp above or below normal temperatures. Um, on the right, uh, we see stronger odds for below normal precipitation. Um, again, in, in kind of southern Arizona and, and New Mexico, and also in the Pacific Northwest with equal chances of above or below normal uh, precipitation elsewhere. And um, I'm going to end there, and I think we'll see if maybe, Joe, if you can check if there's any questions in the chat, um, and if not, we could move on to uh, Roxanne in the Northwest. And I will 
see about. Yeah, no, no questions yet, Dan. So I think we can uh, can move on. And yeah, for folks that would like to ask questions of, of Dan or any of our speakers, just just pop that into the questions box. Okay, I should have just passed that over to Roxanne. Okay, how's that look? Great. Great. It looks Thanks. good to me. Awesome. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Roxanne Carini. I am the Deputy Director of NANUS um, and Senior Oceanographer at the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington. I'm presenting on behalf of Jan Newton, who's our Executive Director. Um, for all of those new folks on the line, I'm super excited to, that you're here. Um, in brief, uh, we are the OOS, the Ocean Observing System that serves Washington and Oregon. So mostly you'll be seeing plots like that from me, but in some of them you'll be able to see the whole West Coast and you'll get California from Henry and Clarissa next. Um, okay, so following along with what Dan just said, um, starting with the global view of sea surface temperature anomaly, um, in January we can see a, still a strong La Nina signal at the equator. Um, and there's also some warmer anomalies in the North Pacific, that red bolus up there. Progressing to February, we see that La Nina signal fading, of course, and um, by March, it's gone, essentially, and um, Dan just confirmed, NOAA says that we're in uh, conditions are neutral and that we're on the watch for an El Nino development. Um, Notably, we do still see that bolus of warm anomaly in the North Pacific, though it is cooler than normal at our coast, that blue near the, co near the coast, excuse me. If we check the marine heat wave tracker, which would then identify areas where the sea surface temperature exceeds say, two standard deviations for at least five consecutive days, um, we do confirm that there's moderate and strong regions of warm anomaly um, that qualify as a marine heat wave but notably, again, there's nothing at our coast, which is great. We can take a closer look near the coast using um, the OSU MODIS sea surface temperature anomalies, also available on the NANUS climatology app. Um, we see that the surface heat anomaly dissipates from January to February. Um, unfortunately, we don't have March right now. We're in the process of transitioning the team responsible for this product, and it will be automated um, its computation will be automated in the future, which will be great, but uh, you just kind of caught us in the middle of it. So we've got January and March. Um, let's turn to the buoys next. Here's the NDBC Washington buoy about 300 nautical miles offshore. It's circled on the map. The seasonal mean and standard deviation curves in black and pink were created from the available record of 45 years of data. Roxanne, I don't think it advanced. Oh. It's not on my, there you go. Got it now? Great. Okay, so um, things were about average in January and most of February, and then we see the temperature dropping to about one standard deviation below the mean, and it stayed there for all of March. Here are four other buoys. All of them are closer to shore. Each is marked on the map from north to south and color-coded, so we've got red, yellow, green, and black marching from north to south. Again, all of those mean curves are made with um, the available record, which varies by buoy, but there's at least 34 years of data in that climatology. Um, and all of the coastal buoys are showing more variability in sea surface temperature than the offshore buoy, but most follow that similar pattern, um, which is hovering around the mean for January and February, and then decreasing to about one standard deviation below the mean for March. Um, St. George's, the one in the bottom right, the farthest south, is a bit of an exception, with the sea surface temperature starting to climb back towards average in the second half of March. Um, continue marching inshore, we can get enter Puget Sound. NANUS helps maintain uh, profiling buoys within Puget Sound, and these are temperature anomalies resolved along the full water column. Just like the coastal assets, we're seeing cooler than average temperature anomalies in the sound. For salinity, um, we see that the signal is weaker in the main basin, which are the plots on the right, um, in Point Wells and Car Inlet, than in Hood Canal, where we see stronger anomalies, which is uh, Hoodsport and Tuano. Um, but overall, for salinity, we're seeing saltier than average salinity. 
which makes sense, especially given what Dan just presented. So um, Dan told us that we've got, especially in, in the Pacific Northwest, we see um, lower than average precipitation for the past month and for the water year, and stream flow forecasts were lower in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in the basins that feed the Puget Sound. And we helped support a Puget Sound metrics dashboard. Um, and for the salinity outputs of that, here's an example from Maine Basin, although it looks very similar when you look at the South Sound or in Hood Canal. Um, and you can see that we have below normal river, river flow output. Um, and so that's kind of the signal that is driving that salinity, saltier than average water, um, even though it feels like we're in everlasting rain up here, but uh, the data doesn't say we are. So <laughs> we'll have to take that as a win. Um, for dissolved oxygen, unlike temperature and salinity, dissolved oxygen do does show a big difference between the basins. And it's very likely due to kind of some different circulation patterns we have. So um, with the annual flushing of Puget Sound by oceanic waters, um, for whatever reason this year, those waters were higher in DO than typical. And that would kind of explain the higher than average DO we're seeing in the main basin, those plots on the right. Um, Hood Canal has a slower time to flush, so um, and it's really long, and so it tends to flush at depth. And so what we could be seeing is old water um, coming out at the surface at Tuano, that blue signal at the surface, at the, the lower than average um, dissolved oxygen at Tuano. Lastly, for anomalies, we'll check on the ocean color as a proxy for chlorophyll A, and these are an OSU MODIS-based product also available on the NANUS Climatology app. Um, they're among the products getting revamped, which is why I only have January and February, but overall we see lower than average um, ocean color or chlorophyll A anomaly, and, um, but we do have some hot spots in Oregon in February along, along the coast there. So to summarize, um, temperature, like Dan said, La Nina signature is dissipated and conditions are neutral. The heat anomaly in the North Pacific persists and it's still considered a marine heat wave, but a moderate and strong category. I think the last time that Jan presented, we were in the strong to severe category, so that's decreased. Um, the coastal buoys are showing pretty average temperature conditions in January, February and cooling in March. The, and the inshore locations show more fluctuation or variability. We're seeing lower than average salinity in the, Pug or higher than average salinity in Puget Sound, which is likely due to the lower than average river outflow. Um, nothing of note on the hypoxia front and ocean color is indicating lower than average biomass along the West Coast. So that is what we usually update on. And I'm just gonna use a tiny bit of time at the end to, um, give you a teaser for some other products that we could include in the future for our West Watch update. And these are inspired heavily by what you're gonna see next from California um, about beach and shoreline surveys, tidal elevations, predictions, and um, conditions and waves. And they have um, historically presented on these and I think NANUS could really um, do a nice job of complementing their reporting in the future. So I'm just gonna give you a little sense. For beach and shoreline surveys, we help the Department of um, State Departments in Oregon and Washington survey. And I actually went out just a couple weeks ago um, and helped. So that's me and Jonathan Allen at Togami, who surveys our beach, and this was Neetart Spit. And so I'm showing you Oregon's coast, but we have extensive surveys up and down and just a taste of the data. So we have um, beach profiles going back from 1997 to today. This isn't the most up-to-date plot, but um, at all those circles on the map before, we've got these plots that show you how it's changed. Um, we also see kind of the position change at certain elevations, so three meters to six meters above sea level. We're looking at large scale changes over time. These are time series um, above. And of course, we've got trends. So over, over the years, um, how has the shoreline uh, eroded or accreted, filled in or gotten um, pushed back at the six meter contour? So this is kind of just a, a teaser of what we've got that we could um, kind of put together for a report out to Westwatch in the future. Tidal elevation predictions and conditions, we've got both of those kinds of data sets on the NANUS platform, um, but we could put them together in a more information, easily digestible way, I think, um, to report out to Westwatch. So that's something that I think we could help with um, from the, contribute more from the Northwest. 
And then lastly, the waves. So you're gonna see beautiful plots from Henry. Mine are not beautiful plots, but we do have wave climatologies. Um, we've got these offshore wave buoys from NDBC. And so you've got the current data in blue and then the climatologies um, in the other, the black and the pink and the red, and you can go by year by year. So what I think we could do with this is, um, you know, show you histograms of what the wave climate, what the wave conditions have been like for the current season, maybe three months at a time or so that we report out on this, and then also have the histogram of what the climatology is. So not only could you see what the distribution of the waves are like right now, but you could compare it to the distribution that, that is the, the climatology. Um, and so we've got that offshore, but we could also do that with our, with our inshore buoys. And this is way too much to look at, but just ripe for um, better synthesis for a report out across the West Coast. And with that, I am done. Thanks. Great, thank you for that, Roxanne. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. And again, if there's time at the end, we can come back to questions if people want to still put them into the chat. Um, but we're going to uh, move down the coast now uh, to Henry with uh, Sincus. And let me see if I can pass that over. All right. Should be going to you now, Henry. All right, is that coming through? Um, yes, now I see it. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about the update from Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System. Um, and so one of the big news items recently for the region and, and the state, of course, is the, the um, salmon fishery closure. And so this is the first closure since 2008-9. Um, and it's really seen as a sort of a combination of things that led to the closure including drought, wild, wildfires, and things that relate to those issues, as well as uh, low ocean abundance forecasts uh, and expected returns. And so, um, yeah, this is just uh, uh, sort of affects throughout the folks for, throughout the region from um, fishing and, and uh, you know, uh, social aspects as well. And uh, another issue that's been sort of prominent in the region um, for several years now has been uh, kelp de declines in kelp, particularly in the northern part of the state. And so what we see here is just a recent uh, release of a tool called kelpwatch.org where one can go and discover information about the kelp abundances um, in a pretty straightforward format. And on the right side, you'll see some time series going back more than um, three decades for uh, kelp coverage for, and then panel C and D, you'll see the Central and Northern California time series. And you, there's these um, sort of reddish bars that uh, punctuate when the, uh, the El Nino and other uh, heat anomalies were occurring around 2015. Um, and you'll see in Northern California, the really abrupt decline um, at that time that hasn't really recovered. There is sort of an indication of recovery over the past year and a half or so, but um, it remains to be seen how that that might um, stick, as it were. Uh, and there are also still some areas of Central California that are also experiencing pretty substantial uh, long-term declines. And here we see a view from the kelpwatch.org tool. Uh, and one can go in there and, and draw a box around a specific geography and get a quick return of time series uh, uh, kelp coverage. And this, this again, goes back um, several decades. And you see on the bottom, of the screen there, uh, the time series, and it, the, the declines in that area have, have gone back to around 2013, 14, but still even lower uh, in the past, um, I don't know, seven years. And so uh, an important issue for the state for lots of reasons. Um, it's a you know, primary habitat for many things, as well as fisheries interests and recreational interests and tourism, all kinds of things. So. Um, yeah, the, again, a convenient way to go and visualize data for folks that are interested. We're looking to bring that um, uh, capability into our data infrastructure as well. And Tom Bell, who's the lead on that, has, is also one of our Senkus um, PIs as well as SCUS. Right, so the runoff. Well, we've heard lots of uh, uh, really um, interesting discussion about um, precipitation and, and, and all these things. And so in our region, we've seen um, this is a satellite image on the right side for the almost the entire region from 15 March. Um, 
and you can see these pretty remarkable plumes of uh, sediment coming out of the rivers. Uh, on the left side is a close-up of Eel River, and on the right side is the San Francisco Bay, Monterey Bay area. And that plume coming off Eel River, this is an example, that looks like it's about almost 50 kilometers offshore, so pretty far-reaching impact. And on the right side, you can see a lot of the coastline, um, you know, from Monterey Bay to San Francisco, having sedimented waters uh, progressing a little bit offshore, and, and almost the entire Monterey Bay um, having sedimented waters. And so here's a um, a, a five-year time series of stream flow from Eel River, uh, and you can see on the right side the most recent uh, event there. The black line is the mean, the uh, red dotted line is the overall maximum um, uh, of any given time during the year. So the black line is kind of the one to pay attention to here, but you can see that the 2019 was also pretty substantial, but the last few years have been pretty low flow, um, just to give a little feel for what that, how unusual the recent stream flow has been uh, there. And uh, as it was mentioned, we've been um, sort of developing this wave tracker visualization for a while and, and happy to have more feedback on it. Um, the the top two panels are the uh, a, a recent, um, well, a, a time series of uh, the wave height at these sea dip stations, the um, coastal data and information program stations, and the the, the left hand side is the uh, period from around uh, the beginning of the year, and the right hand side is a period just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and on the bottom panel, you'll see um, similarly on the left side the uh, beginning of the year, uh, December into January, and then on the right side on the bottom, you'll see the, the past 30 days running up until yesterday. And what you can see is that you know during the atmospheric rivers that were uh, occurring earlier in the year, uh, you know they're coming in um, you know every few days it almost seemed for a while there, but the uh, occurrence of the 15 to 25 foot waves is much less now than it was, uh, which is a great relief to many of us um, I think. And so uh, that's just a sign that things have calmed down a little bit. And this right on the right side you'll see just the the recent forecast from the model that CDIP um, runs and pretty benign conditions at the moment. So the, our, our, as many of you know, we have these uh, shore stations running up and down through the region uh, where this is the um, sensors running at piers and, and marine labs and such things. And this is just a selection of, of three of them. So uh, going from Trinidad in the Eureka area, Bodega Bay, and then on the bottom, you'll see the uh, Moss Landing Marine Lab seawater intake and, and centered in Monterey Bay at 30 meters depth. And so all three of these kind of tell the same story that uh, things have been really cool over the past 180 days, um, right around New Year being a little bit warmer, uh, but but cool throughout most of this um, recent period. And so that's also the similar story for offshore. So just these are um, uh, NDBC buoy data, you know, several kilometers, tens of kilometers offshore in some cases. and Again, though, um, pretty clearly uh, following a similar pattern uh, of generally cool conditions. Uh, as many of you know, we operate a series of um, ocean-going uh, gliders. These are driven by changes in buoyancy in their systems, and they can make ocean sections of, of temperature, salinity, um, and other variables. And so here, just showing temperature for the Monterey Bay uh, glider line, and this runs several hundred kilometers offshore, and you get a little view of what the uh, ocean section can look like. And these sections, as you see them, the left side will be the, the shore facing uh, part of the section and going offshore as we move from left, rather from right to left. And so here we have um, ocean temperature with depth across uh, March, um, rather February, March, and April. And again, these the x-axis of these runs from zero to 400 kilometers offshore as you go from right to left, with the shore being uh, on the right. And so it's also important to point out that the values on the axes are different. They're not all the same. Um, but what we can see going from February to March when we look at the anomalies of these data, which are on the bottom row, is that uh, uh, things are kind of moving towards a, a sort of nominal conditions apart from perhaps the warming that's um, centered around 50, 40, 50 meters depth, uh, just closer to the shore in the, in the Monterey Bay area. 
and we can see how that might develop as, as we look to possible transition into El Nino conditions over the coming months. Uh, and uh, as many folks will know, upwelling is sort of a core uh, ecosystem structuring feature of the West Coast. And so this, this upwelling brings nutrient-rich water uh, from uh, uh, various depths up to the surface where it can influence ocean biology. And so that the, the panels you see here that on the top of the left are the transport index. So this is sort of the physical transport. And then on the right is a biologically effective transport of, of nutrients to nitrate to the surface. And what we can see is that, um, and this, these run from uh, the past, what, three months or so, running up until the end of uh, March here. So, so not, not anything past that time. But what we can see is that the, the indicators are slightly tending towards positive values, so perhaps a bit more. Um, and it's pretty consistent from north to south uh, as, as, as the, those latitude and degrees on the y-axis can indicate. And you can see the boxes from which these values come on the left side uh, as we move in latitud latitudinal bins. Uh, and the bottom bottom row is the same uh, kind of data, just over a longer period to give you a, a little bit of a feel for how things from the last three months compare to a longer a longer period. But again, uh, tending towards positive in both of these at the moment. And also, as was uh, as was sh shown in the Marine Heatwave in, in, uh, dot org index, we've got a, a variant of that um, here that's showing really no uh, indication whatsoever of, of it's the least I've seen since we've started tracking this uh, in terms of heat wave activity. You'll see a little time series there of a sort of an index of heat wave activity over the past three decades or so. But um, yeah, there's all, virtually nothing seen uh, in the past few weeks and nothing forecast for the next few days, which is totally consistent with the larger scale uh, uh, version of this. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I believe that was all for today. The only other thing I'll say is that the uh, multivariate ocean climate indicator is also, uh, the last version of it that we had was also indicating nominal conditions, but we don't have an update for the last period, uh, but it should come out shortly. And I'll pass over to Clarissa if I can do that. There you go. Well, all right. I'm hoping. All systems are a go. Hello. Looking okay? Yep. Yeah. It's good. Thanks, Henry. As Henry pointed out, storm, storm, storms. It's not the political headlines are not the only place where we're seeing stormy weather. So I want to talk though a little bit about um, the it's it's been discussed. It was very nice that Roxanne gave this kind of prelude into what we've been doing, thinking about coastal inundation here, um, how how we measure that, forecast that. And so um, I am not going to jump right into my 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 own SCUS update right now, but I want to pass this over to um, Julia Fiedler, who has been putting together some really nice um, syntheses of what it looks like here, looked like here in Southern California during a number of these storms this spring. Um, and she has put together a story map that she's going to share that pulls together a lot of um, SCUS data and other data from Scripps. And she's a physical oceanographer here at Scripps. So um, right as we start, I'm going to pass it to you. If I can figure that out, change presenter. Um, there we go. Is that going to work? Do you see anything on your end or do I have to stop sharing? I don't see anything on my end. I could also try to pass it to, uh, let's see. Oh, I see that. Okay. I think I got it to work. Okay. All right. Let's make that bigger. All right. You can all see that now. Um, all right, so as Clarissa said, I'm gonna share a little bit about the, um, not all the events, this is the January 6th flooding event that we had um, in SoCal. And it was really made to be sort of a post-mortem on our uh, forecasts that we have, um, sort of figuring out why they worked, why they didn't work. Um, so I'll just show you a few photos and of the forecast. 
So um, our Torrey Pines forecast that we had here was actually using the, the wrong model in the beginning. Um, and so none of our triggers went off to tell us that anything was coming up um, at this site. Um, but uh, once we did fix it, uh, even once it got fixed, we were getting anomalously low values. Um, so, so the waves were not predicted to be quite as high here. Um, it definitely was over predicted at our um, at our offshore buoys or our nearshore buoys, and it stayed elevated for a really, really long time. Um, and that sort of helped create a, a system where we could get all this uh, flooding. So for about 12 hours straight, it was over three meters, um, which is exceptionally rare here in SoCal. Uh, and our, our forecast was also using a older beach slope that's this slider here on the left um, versus this is the beach slope after the, the January event. So um, we think that that also probably contributed to why things went wrong. Um, and then what we have for validation up here is a coast snap cradle uh, at Torrey Pines and uh, it was raining a bunch. So the trails were all closed off. So we weren't able to get this validation data in there in time. So. Uh, a lot of lessons being learned here for this one. Um, but yeah, there were cobbles, kelp, um, overtopping at this location. Um, in Del Mar, we also saw similar issues with flooding into the houses. There were also um, some damage to the houses that are there on the shoreline as well, um, and presumably flooding. Uh, Part of Seaside Lot also was overtopped. Um, this is a parking lot. This is not actually sand. It looks like you're on the beach. Um, and here at Cardiff, we there is the living shoreline dunes over here, and those were completely eaten away in January. And um, as of January 17th, when we took this drone photo, uh, nothing had come back, and it's it's still pretty much like that. Um, the recovery is going to be pretty slow here. And so uh, Imperial Beach, we also saw pretty much similar things. That one we did get the forecast correct, so cheers on that. And um, we have a flood submission site now. Um, and so we have photos of this event and other events uh, that occurred during that, basically from January until now. Um, and we are trying to incorporate older photos into it as well. So for that, Clarissa, I will pass it back to you if I can figure <laughs> out how to do that. I'm sure you'll have more success than I do. <laughs> that was great, Julia. This is Dan again. I just have a, a quick question. So are, are these story maps, was that kind of a special thing just for that event or, or do you periodically do other event story maps? That was really cool. Uh, I, I think the goal eventually is to make more of these. Um, January 6th was really the largest of the events that we got, so um, that's why we have the postmortem on that one. But um, I think going into the future, it's a good idea for documentation for sure. Thank you. Okay, so I know we don't have a lot of time, and I and I do want to make sure there's time for questions. So, um, oh, what just happened? I don't think I did that. Do you want to reshare? Have me reshare? Does it say I'm showing? Did my my screen just went away, right? Uh, just... I saw it there a minute, and now it's gone. Um, but I see your desktop. Again? There it is. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on through some of the slides that we put together that summarizes a lot of I think the information that you've seen um, so far from some of what Henry showed, um, but showing data from sea dip buoys that do span California, so not just Southern California. Um, we have, we're talking a lot these days about how cold it's been. Um, so moving away from the wave activity discussion, which you can, I should point out, you can see anything you wanna see about the kind of climatology and interesting things that's happening with waves in the bulletins that um, sea dip and Jim Barron's put together, um, I think on a monthly basis. And, um, but in terms of temperature, we're pointing out here that the record has been low with um, many of the daily records um, either reaching or exceeding 
the historic minima in those time series at those buoys. This has been all over the headlines. We've seen this media blitz about these frigid temperatures, uh, wanting to know what's causing it, um, how unusual it is. Uh, while these records maybe aren't incredibly long on the seated buoys, we do have some longer records. Uh, we do have, of course, our shore stations for SCUS, and those are showing concomitant decreases near shore. Uh, but if you go to Scripps Pier, where we do have about a hundred year or more record, we've got, um, again, a very clear sense that we've been reaching those minima um, the last month or so, seeing some really dramatic drops associated with upwelling near the coast. Um, the climate folks here at Scripps have said that this is pretty clearly associated with sensible latent surface heat loss. We see westward Ekman transport, a lot of enhanced upwelling near the coast, up to about 25 kilometers offshore. So that has been defining um, a lot of what we're seeing lately. And along with that, um, we have some subsurface cooling caught by the gliders. Um, Henry gave a nice introduction into the California Underwater Glider Network. This is run by Dan Rudnick here at Scripps. And what we wanna say here is that, you know, we've got this SoCal index of temperature that we define around line 90. This is Cal Coffee Cruise 90. Um, looking at that anomaly of temperature at 50 meters and how that tracks relative to the oceanic Nino index. If you look at the Hovmuller diagram on the left, you'll see that as we came out of that Pacific warm anomaly period, we've had general cooling at 50 meters. Um, but overall, as has been pointed out, there still is kind of an anomalous warming as a background temperature that is really seen here on the plot on the right, where you see that elevated anomaly at 50 meters in Southern California relative to the oceanic Nino index. Now, while they're fairly tightly coupled, they were not during the 2015, 2016 Pacific El Nino um, warm anomaly and then El Nino event, but then they sort of rejoined. They have been tracking each other quite nicely, but with this interesting separation that is pretty evident here. Uh, in terms of the biological response, uh, we didn't get into HABs with the Senkus report. Um, Henry always kindly saves that for me. So I want to point out that looking at our monitoring that we do at all these stations in California, um, we have a few further north um, of Santa Cruz, but the ones that have the most consistent time series are Santa Cruz Wharf down to Scripps Pier. And the response we've seen for HABs, primarily from the diatom community, and the only HAB in that community is Sudnichia, the one we worry a lot about in California because of domoic acid production. There we have seen um, both the really toxigenic size class of that of that genus and the less toxigenic group rising together in many of our Southern California stations. We've not seen that so much at the Northern California stations. Um, this is somewhat interesting given the fact that if you look at our, our maps, our probability maps, uh, did I just advance? Yeah, looking at our probability maps, you'll see that, um, I don't know why I can't go back. Uh, there we go. Looking at probability maps of domoic acid production, you're gonna see that the, the, the bolus is really confined to the Southern California bite. And um, it looks as though the predictions are certainly mapping well to what we see at the shore stations when we measure at least the groups that can cause domoic acid production. These are, we're not really looking at DA here. We don't have those measurements quite ready. But um, it looks like there's a lot happening. Uh, I was out in Monterey Bay last week doing some experiments. Uh, winds were really picking up and we started to see not only increase in plankton production, but we were looking in real time at domoic acid using long range AUVs and other, um, other technology. And we were able to see that domoic acid looks like it is indeed turning on as a result of these major upwelling pulses that we're having right now. And we have imaging flow cytobots at a lot of these sites. We didn't necessarily pick up this diatom bloom at those sites, but we have seen some red tides here as of late. There's been one occurring Orange County to San Diego, and you can see some of the organisms that are responsible for that in these images here, things like serratium, percentrum. We've also seen some lingulodinium, and that's the really pretty bioluminescent one. So if you can catch that, try to get out and catch it. And I also refer you to our HAB bulletins, which are a monthly synthesis of all this information and all the modeling and how it comes together. Um, and so I think that's it. I'll finally advance to my last slide for real. 
Uh, we have a strategic plan. If you want to go check that out online, that's brand new. Um, and thank you. And thank you to all of my contributors and collaborators on this talk. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Clarissa, and uh, everyone else who contributed and presented today. Um, I still don't see any questions. Uh, quiet audience today. Um, but uh, one thing I did want to uh, pass it over to Joe Sola, the Regional Climate Services Director, um, who I think wanted to speak a little bit about uh, the uh, next West Watch for next month. Joe, are you on the line? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, oh, and Mike Anderson did have a, a couple questions about copies of the slides to get some of the links that are in there. Um, normally, we, we do post a video, but I think if you wanted the slides themselves, maybe um, reach out to the presenters to see if they're they're okay with that. But otherwise, the the video should be up for, um, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, I want to make a plug. Uh, first of all, thank you to Clarissa, Julia, Roxanne, Henry, Dan for putting on another great episode of uh, Westwatch. And a quick plug for our May uh, edition, which will be the third Tuesday in May at uh, 1 p.m. We'll do a shift a little earlier, 1 p.m. Pacific. We're going to focus on a health topic, uh, a little change from, from maybe our traditional. Uh, we'll have uh, Joe Krieger, who runs the Invasives Program for National Marine Fisheries, uh, probably talking about green crabs in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Karen Holcomb, who works with CDC, but was a uh, former NOAA uh, postdoc, or at least NOAA collaborator postdoc. And she'll be talking about West Nile virus and other uh, vector-borne diseases. And then Morgan Gorris, who uh, works at Los Alamos, talking about West Nile, I'm um, sorry, Valley fever. And all of the talks we'll talk, we'll discuss the relationship to climate. So how climate variability and change are affecting both the spatial extent where these uh, diseases or organisms are found, as well as the, the temporal, the time of year when we are experiencing these. Uh, but other than that, um, thank you very much for tuning in and uh, please check out the West Watch website to, uh, to view this or share with colleagues who might not have been able to make it and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone.